we want nighttime John. We want child is asleep. Okay. You're going to bed. Don't want to be awoken, but I am paid to be on call, John. Right. And I think I have a case of acute cholecystitis in the ED. Yeah. And I call <clears> you, <throat> and I'm going to go through my whole shtick. What are the parts of the history or the physical that you actually care to hear? Yeah, so I, I think the, any history you could provide in terms of chronicity of symptoms, um, how sick is the patient? Are they looking septic, like thinking something worse than cholecystitis, like ascending cholangitis? Uh, ultrasound findings are helpful, and we can talk about those. Uh, also, um, their bilirubin, are, are they showing any signs of obstruction from a stone that slipped down into the common duct? Uh, those are all helpful things to know. Okay, so biliary obstruction I get. We're going to talk about what that's a, that's a different path. Right. If they're sick, sure. Why does chronicity matter? What are you thinking when you're listening for this is the fourth time they've been with this versus this is a one-off thing? Yeah, so a lot of folks kind of grin and bear it at home. Uh, I worked as a surgeon at the VA for a while, and that was a very, uh, those patients are, are very kind of classically will come in after four or five episodes of quote-unquote acute cholecystitis, and now they've got chronic inflammation of the gallbladder, which I'm thinking, all right, this is not something emergently to deal with. And I know that once I get in there, a lot of important stuff is going to be stuck to that gallbladder. So this can be a very challenging operation. And so I may need to look at comorbidities and, and timing of the operation versus the cholecystostomy to be uh, depending on, you know, other factors with the patient okay. comorbidities. Ultrasound is hard because anytime I'm pumped up about what I found, inevitably the surgeon doesn't care. <laughs> so I'd be like, there's a, there's a ton of sludge, there's yeah. fluid, it, the wall is thick. I get stones. I mean, if, sure. there, if there's stones, you need to know about that. But why am I disproportionately excited about things? And you guys don't seem to care. So what do you care about on, on an ultrasound? What's getting you in your car or getting you to admit this patient based on an ultrasound for acute cholecystitis? Yeah, so for acute cholecystitis, you, you really, for important things for me are going to be gallbladder wall thickened and pericholecystic fluids, any signs of inflammation. And then Putting that together with their history, is this an acute, acute on chronic process or just kind of chronic? Um, sludge is sort of this, all right, there's, there's some stuff in the gallbladder and if there's only sludge and nothing else, maybe this person just has sort of biliary colic or occasionally passing some sludgy stones, that kind of thing. So you're, it's just giving you an idea of, of what the process going on is. Is this truly acute cholecystitis and do they need to come in to be operated on, get some antibiotics, that type of thing. But good story and all I'm seeing is sludge, John Hunter's not operating on that patient tonight. No, uh, usually not. Uh, actually, no. Uh, doing, I, I, I talked to the residents about try to never operate on a gallbladder in the middle of the night. Why? And the reason is, is it, it's a very common operation, right? It's one of the more, most common operations in the U.S. Um, but it, and it, it is typically a straightforward, simple operation until it's not. And when it's not, it can get really bad. If any of you ever worked in uh, ICUs as well, the patients that come in with gallbladder or cholecyst injuries during cholecystectomies to the common duct um, can get very, very sick and die. Uh, and they can sit in the hospital for months and months and months with horrible uh, bile leaks and that type of thing. So it, it, it's not an operation you want to do with the C or the D team in the middle of the night. You want to have all resources available. Um, during the day, uh, you want to have, you know, backup colleagues to help you with difficult cases, uh, you know, difficult situations. So it, it, it's, it, especially in an inflamed gallbladder, things can get really bad really fast and the complications can be devastating. The consent process for the D team overnight operation is probably a little bit grim. Like we're going to do <laughs> some stuff and try. We, we hope this goes well. Yeah. It, yeah. And I know you as well as anybody in the world. I don't know if I'll get an honest answer from you with this question, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I get tons of CAT scans, as you'd say, because we're ER docs and that's what we do. We get a lot of CAT scans based on weird stories. We back into sure. a lot of stuff. And then I'm pumped up and I have to kind of make like I thought this was going to be what I found. But I often find cholecystitis on a CT scan. Mm -hmm. I've read the literature. You've read the literature. I'm convinced. I mean, it's a, it's a very accurate test. Yeah. But when I call and say my CT scan shows cholecystitis, the story fits. They've got a white count. They're not obstructed. No biliary obstruction. I always get call us when the ultrasound is back. I'm yeah. convinced that's work avoidance. <laughs> why, why, if we have the answer, do we need another look at the same answer? Yeah, I think th there, there may be a little bit of work avoidance there, but I do think an ultrasound is valuable. I don't think CTs do as good a job of looking at stones. Some stones just don't show up well in CT. So an ultrasound will give you an idea of, 
are there stones present? Why is that important? Well, if I'm going to take this patient to the operating room, if I know that there are stones present, I may, I may need to do something during the operation to evaluate the common bile duct to make sure that the stones are cleared. Um, and that just adds more to the operation. So that's helpful. It's just gaining more information. It's a very low cost, low morbid procedure or uh, test, right? An ultrasound. And, and honestly, you know, I think a sonographic Murphy sign is really helpful. Is, is, is this gallbladder acutely inflamed? Whereas if I'm doing targeted pressure on it, it's, it's really hurting. That's, I, to me, that's helpful information. You cracked open a door that I didn't think we were gonna go through, but we are. Uh, right. Sonographic Murphys. I regularly hear from surgeons, we would know if you hadn't given them pain medication. So if I give patients Dilaudid, which we established today is the right medicine for all, right. <laughs> and they don't have a sonographic Murphys, in the read, you know, radiology yeah. is in cahoots with you guys, and they say unable to evaluate because I got pain medicine seven hours ago. Yeah. Do you believe that the sonographic Murphy sign loses utility if they've been treated for pain, or do you still think it's just a targeted exam finding that should be positive? Well, I mean, some people may react. It just depends on the degree of inflammation. So I, I think if it's positive, even despite pain medicine, that's an even more positive sonographic Murphy sign, right? So, but if it's negative, that's not, it, it's just one tiny piece of the whole puzzle. So it's not gonna send me either way down the algorithm. You were talking stones. And I think that's a, a big tip is that ultrasound is going to be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. In your eyes, it's going to give you data about stones. Break down for us. I mean, we've got two options. And I was always under the impression that if there's a stone in the duct, you have the skills to pull it out, right? Uh, typically, yes. It, but it can get complicated. So tip, if, if somebody's presenting with obstructing cholelithiasis, uh, nowadays we can get our GI colleagues to perform an ERCP extract that stone, um, open up the uh, sphincter there, and let, let that correct itself, let that obstruction correct itself. And then the, the patient can get a cholecystectomy, typically during that hospitalization. Um, it, that's way easier than an intraoperative bile duct exploration. That's sort of a, people still do them, but out of necessity, you much, it's much easier, better for the patient, I think, to get an ERCP in stone extraction. So uh, the, the stone situation, just we're thinking about, do we need to engage with GI first? to go ahead and relieve this obstruction and then and do the cholecystectomy afterwards. So if it's your family member, you would rather have an ERCP yeah. first, get the gallbladder yeah, out. If they've got obstructing down. stone disease, then yes, uh, I think an ERCP is gonna be much better if you've got that capability at your institution. Would you recommend if somebody's out at a critical access hospital or I mean, not even at a community hospital that doesn't have ERCP available, is it better to transfer a patient with obstructing stones to get an ERCP versus have the local surgeon try to get it out? It, it's that's entirely up to that local surgeon. So we teach our residents during mock oral practice and that kind of stuff. If, if this is something that you don't think you should be handling at your, wherever you are, if you're in Backwoods, Alabama, then these things should be transferred. Um, the, uh, the, the pressure in the gallbladder can be relieved even with an intraoperative place uh, um, cholecystostomy tube. You don't have to dive into this complex stone that's in the duodenum and obstructing, send it to somewhere that has more experience and a patibiliary surgeon that could deal with that or a GI doc that can do an ERCP. If I'm in the community, should my first call be to my local surgeon and kind of get a feel for their comfort level or should I automatically say, if we don't have ERCP, I should look for a transfer? No, you should involve the surgeon, I, I think for sure, because they're gonna have a, a better sense of, of what the local uh, abilities are. Uh, with the, that gastroenterologist. Uh, and so they're gonna be, help you guide, guide that patient to the right care if it's not gonna be at that hospital. Okay, and last question, and this is a little more, I mean, I think I, I wanna accuse you of more work avoidance than you're probably guilty right. of. <laughs> but a lot of times I'll get the, yeah, good job, you found a, a hot gallbladder, give them some antibiotics, admit them to some service, and then tomorrow we'll come around and see them and take it out. Yeah. I, I, I thought of this as a time-dependent surgical emergency, is there, are outcomes better if we cool it off first, or is it more about avoiding that D-team overnight operation? It, it, it's a lot of things, and it, it, it's gonna depend also on your healthcare system. Some healthcare systems are just so bare bones at night that operating in the middle of the night is, is challenging. You only wanna do it in a life-threatening situation. This is not a life-threatening situation. And like I said, these operations can be very, very hard when they're not straightforward, and so, having all resources available during the light of day is, is a much safer way to go about taking out a gallbladder. So this patient didn't just get a cholecystitis an hour ago and show up to the ER. They've had it, it's a progressive disease. Starting antibiotics, cooling them off, giving, doing a little resuscitation and, and waiting till the light of day, I think is, is a, a very safe thing to do. And, and it's 
probably going to benefit the patient. Dr. John Hunter, you are no D-teamer, my friend. Thanks for coming <laughs> and letting us uh, right. accuse you it. of being lazy. Thanks. Appreciate it.